My name's Hannah and I work in the TSR community, which means that day in, day out, I am online reading about what young people are talking about. Uh, I might take a gaze at the homepage and see anything from I start with my boyfriend last night to uh, the civil service fast stream application chat to will this prestigious university accept me or should I follow my heart and go to the one that I really want to go to, followed by how do I apply for student finance to something along the lines of how do I get a part-time interview for Waitrose? So like a huge wealth of dialogue and conversation. And that's what the student room really is. It's a window into the student world, into the student life. So anything that a young person is going through is talked about on the student room. And yeah, sometimes it can be a little bit eye-watering. But if you do take your kind of your focus back to when you were young, and some of the questions that you had as you were growing up, as you were making decisions, as you were living your life, they'll probably really resonate with you. If you have children, you'll probably want to put your hands over your eyes and think, I hope that's not what my child is either going through or thinking about right now, because that doesn't feel good. Um, but lo and behold, parents do also use the student room because it educates them and it helps them to support the child in their life and what they're going through. So ultimately what TSR is about is it's about dialogue. Um, it's, about, it's a place where young people feel that they can have an open and honest conversation relatively informally and anonymously. And when they do that, they can then receive a wealth of information, knowledge and insight to then be able to make a more informed decision that ultimately will serve them. So this is our masterclass for you today. We're going to talk about how young people feel, the fact that they do need to talk, the fact that young people do tell us about their thoughts about the future and about how they're feeling, which sometimes does enable us to actually predict the future. And then how young people actually do engage with us when we ask them questions. So these next few slides are some results on a number of polls that we run across the site. Uh, not all of these polls are set up by myself or by our teams at, at TSR, by our staff members. These are set up also within the community. Um, and I'll guide you through this as I talk. So this is just to give you a flavour of kind of the different views and opinions that young people are having around the UK right now and over the last kind of year or so. Um, before we get there, I just want to talk a little bit about this point that I talk about all the time. Drowning in information, starving for wisdom. This is a generation that has grown up in the digital age. They have more access to information in their fingertips through their devices than any other generation, but they are also the most stressed, the most confused, and the most driven by comparison. And so, although they have all this information, they don't have anyone actually helping them necessarily to guide them through it. So as careers advice gets lower down the priority list, as the curriculum gets more and more intense around academia, there is a space to think and there is less time for them to be coached to make a decision that really serves them. So actually doing something that feels good as opposed to something that they should do. So all around that, I'm kind of filling their consciousness as the pressure to get it right first time. So ultimately driven by comparison and online symbols of success. And some of this might resonate with you as well. It's not something that unfortunately we ever grow out of. There's also been a lot of political turbulence, um, of course, and Brexit. Uh, and they're essentially maybe inheriting something that they really didn't want or they don't resonate with. Everything is more expensive and they're growing up in what we all perceive to be maybe more of a dangerous world, both locally and globally. And that's a lot of because of the media messages and the narratives that's being fed through uh, to us all the time. And also finally, in I'm sure this won't be a surprise to anybody, they're part of an increasingly anxious society. So, here's the start of our polls. Uh, voting intentions, so taking ourselves back to last year. Uh, this was just around the time when the general election was announced, back in March. Who will you vote for in the general election? Um, probably not surprised, obviously we know now that Corbyn got the youth vote. Um, but I think what's really interesting to share with you is that when these big events happen, we actually set up one separate kind of forum, one separate chat room to just talk about the general election or just talk about the referendum. And so in this particular poll right at the start, which was just run over a couple of days, we received 1,300 uh, responses. But we also found this out as well. So just after that, we found about 80% thought the government did not pay enough attention to them. 
um, which was obviously a bit of a concern uh, given that this was a real pivotal time for them to actually get up and vote, especially with the outcome of the EU referendum. So we had a number of polls. We do around six polls ahead of any general election. And this was the poll of polls. This was the final poll before the big day itself. And you can see how all of a sudden Labour started to crush it. And we could see that that's where the youth were going to place their vote on the day. This was from 2,827 respondents who just voted on a poll on TSR. Then we did an exit poll. And interestingly, it was pretty much exactly the same result. So we had predicted it, but this was a respondent rate of over 6,000 people. So the variation in response was hugely different, but the actual data, the stats, was very, very similar. It's really, really, really interesting. Um, and I think it's worth saying, you know, ultimately, um, when these big events are happening, um, when there is a series of events like, you know, the general election, or the EU referendum, or even Brexit. Um, all of those discussions, I think there's generally a fair amount of fatigue now around Brexit, but they're still talking about it. And so for us, it's about us giving them an opportunity to talk in a safe space where they can actually understand and where they can start to form their own opinions. Because if TSR is anything, it's definitely not an echo chamber. So then their voice in the EU. Should there be a second EU referendum? So a couple of weeks ago, we invited on our, um, we created a guest lecture space and we invited a professor from Kill University who'd written in the conversation about whether a second referendum would be um, a betrayal psychologically. It's a really interesting debate. I had nearly 200 responses and 64% said yes, they did want a second EU referendum. 90% of students think they are responsible for their success at uni. And again, I think this is really great given the whole labelling around the snowflake generation, around how now that they might be customers when it comes to higher education, that they simply just want their degree written out for them and all their work done. That's not true. They do think that they are responsible, that they do have to put the work in. This was a conversation that was also guided by um, one of another university lecturer as part of our guest lecture debates. And again, what I think is really interesting that although page views, so although lots of people are viewing our political forums, um, that there's been a slight drop in posting because there haven't been as big events going on this year, but instead you're seeing that the amount of discussion and page views is really lifting in our educational debate forum. It's that narrative around the cost of going to university, the value of different degrees, the value of um, what higher education should be offering is being debated. So as it's kind of being pushed around in the media a lot, um, they are conscious of that. And so it's becoming something that they're talking a lot more about. Sex education. So we have a sexual health forum. So we aren't only all about education in the student room. We have a huge amount of forums that just focus around life. So mental health, sexual health, family, um, hobbies, as I talked about politics. Um, and so we are aware, especially with something around sex, something that isn't always the easiest thing to talk about when you're growing up, a lot of the time they'll view. So they'll look at um, what other young people are talking about when it comes to um, kind of sex and educating themselves. Um, kind of quite worryingly, but not a surprise, uh, given that there's been less time invested in sex education in schools, students told us that they weren't overwhelmed by the education that they'd received. Um, even more worryingly, given again that there is so much access to this information where a young person can educate themselves, 58% uh, of sexually active students have never had an STI test, and 66 have had unprotected sex. Um, which again suggests that something more needs to be done. Uh, and so from this, so when we kind of receive this insight through um, our members, through people that are visiting the website, we then try and generate really helpful, supportive content that essentially bridges the gap um, so that they are then able to make those informed decisions and we set that hub up uh, to support them. Um, and we also share with this information, so we don't just do the insights, we don't just do the research, chew the fat and then 
uh, spit something out in the form of a hub, we actually then educate them on, okay, well, this is how you maybe respond to the question, this is how your peers are feeling, like, you're not alone. It's all about normalising. Coming into mental health, um, again, probably not surprising, although it feels like we're all talking about our mental health a lot more, 53% felt it's easier to talk about their mental health anonymously than to a friend or a family. And mental health is really affecting uh, decision making, especially around university applicants. So one in five were put off going to university because of their anxiety. Uh, we know that 25% actually changed their institution or rethought the institution because of their mental health. So that could be about location, um, or it maybe could, because they perceived that the support wouldn't be there for them. And I think 35% also felt that it would affect their course choice. So that could mean that maybe they go for a choice that they might, they might perceive to be easier, um, or that again, they might feel might have more contact time to keep them in line. There's a whole wealth of reasons why that could be. But ultimately, being happy is the long-term motivation for the future. And I guess, what does that even mean? What does happiness mean? It means so many different things to so many different people. But I always like to kind of share, I, the reason and I, I feel this is because I think, you know, they ultimately grew up in a time where there's been a lot of bad news, it's a bad news world, and there is something in the fact that when they were growing up in very kind of, you know, the therapist thinks in me, um, in these really pivotal years where they're getting a sense of the world around them, they could have had one or two parents that were made redundant. The economic crash was happening when their brains were forming. There's a lot going on. And so actually, you know, the household income in their, in their family could have been hugely affected. Um, their communities could have been hugely affected. There's a lot going on. Um, and so for them, I think, yeah, it's kind of going back to simplicity as much as they can. And although they might not talk about being happy and they might not share that really, really openly because all of, of course it's all about going to the right university or getting the right apprenticeship, or getting the right grades or looking, you know, the best they can look or whatever it is, I think underneath it all, as we all will probably feel, being happy is the most important thing. So, young people need to talk. So, you're 16 going on 17, what are they talking about? And this is a busy slide and it probably breaks all the PowerPoint rules, um, but there might be some key words or statements that are popping out to you. And just so you know, these are actual, these are actual conversation headings that I've picked out of the student room. So for example, I'll always be sad and nobody cares, to I'm predicted all fives for colleges accept me, to my best friend has depression and I can't take it anymore. Our apprenticeship's actually better to how do I get rid of a spot overnight? <laughs> it's everything that you would expect a young person to think about, but all of this is going on, and I think very often when we're trying to communicate with young people or market to them, we assume that they want to hear what we have to say because what we have to say is really important. When you've got all of this going on, what you have to say isn't necessarily really important to them. So you need to find a way, a niche, that will actually take them on a journey with you and will maybe to appeal to one of these things, to get them to listen, to get their attention. Because, like all of us now, they have a short attention span. So it's all about meeting them where they're at, taking them by the hand, and starting to build that relationship, build that trust. And that's why we have all of this content on TSR, because they trust us as a platform. So, Apart from everything that's going on in their world, in their bubble, in their school, in their college, at their uni, wherever they're at, you also have all of this going on. So what they hear about. So this is the narrative. This is everything that's feeding into their consciousness. This is the fear building. This is the, oh God, I just want to be happy, or I just want to actually move to an island somewhere really remote and not have to worry about this anymore. Things like, for example, mass extinction of wildlife, plastic, a woman blowing herself up in Tunisia, a student suing a university because they feel that they've been sold a Mickey Mouse degree. Russell groups having that halo effect, being told that they're the most prestigious, the best universities, that's what they should be aiming for. Yet here it's reported that they're falling short of the quality benchmark when it comes to the TEF. That dropout rates are higher in their third successive year, but I thought university was the best thing for me to do. I thought that's what everyone needs to do to be successful. Stroke, if you go to London, you're going to get knifed. Again, like, okay, that's a generalisation, but again, it's, you know, it's, this is going on all the time, and this information is constantly going through their phones, and so it's just, you can imagine just 
how much chaos is happening in here when they're still trying to make these really important decisions because these are formative years for them again in kind of setting the foundations for their life for not only further education but also work uh, and then you know growing up when they're kind of cultivated those years to then you know maybe buy a home or move away or whatever it is these are all really really important times so that's what we do for them we're a platform for dialogue this is a place where they can talk about their fears around terrorism or plastic or um, you know, debate the TEF till the cows come home, debate league tables, whatever it is. But it's also a place where they can get support around entering into their first relationship or trying to get support around not necessarily self-diagnosing their mental health, but just saying, this is how I feel. And does anyone else, have you ever felt like that? What, what does it feel like to you? So being able to kind of understand their, maybe their symptoms a little bit more about making a choice about what are the right subjects to take um, if they want to aspire to do this vocation. It's a huge amount of discussion and it's all organic. So sometimes myself or someone in the team or a volunteer might seed, um, might seed a discussion. So if we see something in the media that we think needs to be talked about or they would create a lot of value for them to talk about it with us, we'll set that up. But ultimately the conversations day in, day out are set up by members. It's between other students as peers. So again, it's about talking in their language, um, not trying too hard, not talking in a certain way. It's just you know, them being able to talk in a language that feels good, that's understood. Um, and also then, you know, it's not just students and students, it's between students and the government. It's also between brands, universities, academics and teachers. And like I said, we also have um, professionals and we also have um, parents. And it's not always clear who these people are, but what it brings is a diverse set of values and opinions and wisdom. And it's absolutely magic, because you can just basically, if you're a student coming to the TSR for the first time, I call them magpies. They come in and they find the shiny bits of information and they're like, I want that bit and I want that bit and I want that bit. And from that I'll make a decision. But then you also have the bumblebees and they're, those, they're the pollinators. So those are the members that have maybe been on TSR for like 10 years. They've grown up through the system. They're now doctors or whatnot. Um, or, you know, they've had kids there themselves now, but they still want to help out because of the support they received. And they will give that information. And the more they pollinate, the more the magpies come back until they transform into butterflies. Sorry, butterflies? Well, yeah, they do. They transform into butterflies and bumblebees. <laughs> um, and then it's also between um, TSR staff, so myself and the community team and our other members of staff. And we also have volunteers, and Chelsea, who we'll introduce you to later, is a volunteer, but TSR, the community has always been supported by a group of volunteers. We all now have over 150, and they are within all the different sections of the site. They are mainly students, but we do have some teachers some parents and some professionals who are there to essentially support and guide young people in making really important decisions. So to bridge the gap, um, our dialogue ultimately delivers knowledge, information, insight. It's how they are making informed decisions. I meet people every day and when I tell them where they work, they are, oh, I use TSR. All right, how'd you find it? Oh, I just typed something into Google. Oh, great. It really helped me do this, this or this. It's, and it's really interesting the amount of people that have found it, have uncovered it, have used it to make decisions. But what's really important is that it helps them to make it, get a sense check. So again, where you have so many, you know, so much information on YouTube, on Wikipedia, across the whole internet, you ask why is why is it that we even need to exist? Like they could just read something or watch something and then they could make a decision. We're all human. We love to have a good old chat. We love to chew the fat, and that is a big part of what TSR does. And of course, because it is anonymous, you can share how much you want to share. It means that you can talk more honestly on a broader range of topics. And interestingly, if you want to speak about something in the sexual health or mental health forum, you can actually anonymise your account. So that means that no one will even know who you are. So if you regularly talk on the forum elsewhere, you're essentially, you know, in their words, probably quite protected and remain anonymous. So they can be a little bit more open about maybe the advice that they need or what's going on for them. So, young people tell us their thoughts about the future. Medicine applications decline. So, back in 2016, there was the junior doctors round. This was kind of going on at the back end of 2015 as well. We have a really strong medical community. So, not only those that have actually graduated into medicine, but those that are considering it. 
And because of all of this conversation, it was already quite um, big on TSR in terms of the amount of people that were talking about it. So we ran uh, some insights, and what we found out was that over a third of students no longer wish to study medicine, and this was published in The Independent. Uh, in the new year. So this was published just before the main UCAS deadline, but obviously just after the medicine deadline, which is a little bit earlier in October. And um, then lo and behold, when, the, when UCAS actually posted um, the data, uh, we confirmed that it was true. That yeah, there was a decline in applications, and there had been, uh, but the decline had jumped up again, potentially because of because of this, because of the row, because of, again, all the media attention around it. Um, and there's a quote there um, from the co-chair of the BMA Medical Students Committee uh, about how he felt that there had been an impact because of the breakdown of trust between doctors and the medical profession and the government.